Hi, Bob. You know, I know you go uh, bouncing all over the country for SSI, talking to some of the biggest companies on the globe about polishing concrete. So I got a question for you is, what are the most important things to make sure of when a floor is going to be polished? Hey, Jim, good to see you. Um, boy, that's a loaded question. And uh, do you have a couple of days for that answer? And <laughs> in, all, in all sincerity, um, you know, some of the common issues that I, I see on a, on a daily basis when, when partnering with place and finish crews and or polishing crews really starts with mix design. You have to go to have a good cohesive mix design. Oftentimes polishing contractors, they show up on a job site to polish the concrete and uh, well, take this picture for example, not realizing what potentially could have happened. And in this case, um, believe it or not, that's an over sanded mix. And what happens is it can be as little as maybe 100 pounds per cubic yard of uh, an over sanded mix. And it, it tends to roll the concrete during the, um, the, the finishing phase. And so it's creating small high spots. And then when they're doing the final trialing of this, you get this kind of an effect. And unfortunately, it's difficult to overcome that. And really the only thing that can be done is to cut it down deeper. And then you, the thing you gotta be careful about is if you cut it deeper and you know you potentially are gonna expose aggregates. And I mean, the customer's not gonna be happy with that, right? With one level of aggregate exposed here, uh, minimally exposed there. Uh, how, do you end up with a happy customer with that problem? It, it is, you're, you're, you're exactly right. And in this instance right here, you know, oftentimes we, we're working to a national specification and um, per the CPC, Concrete Polishing Council, a class B, for example, would be considered a salt and pepper finish. And, you know, if we had a salt and pepper finish here, a class B, you would still see all that variation. And so you would have to cut it deeper. And that's where you'd be getting into a potentially a class C, which is an exposed aggregate. So I guess what's really important for the polishing contractor to be made aware of is, you know, evaluate the floor before you start because it could come back and haunt you in the end. Good point. What do we got here? Yeah, so that gets back to the it gets back to the importance of the mix design. Proper proportions of the mix are super critical. Um, and there are so many variations when you travel across the country in terms of the hardness of the aggregates, the types of sand that they use. And now as an industry, we're having all these, um, you know, cement substitution, you know, like, uh, uh, ground limestone, a type one L cement. We have uh, different porcelains, fly ash, for example, granulated blast slag that ultimately all affects how the concrete is placed and finished, which also affects how that concrete is polished. So in some regions, um, to cut expenses, ready mix producers will use a manufactured sand. And what, what that is, is they'll take the retains from the aggregates, the, the fines, and they'll put that back into the mix um, compared to a natural sand. And if you have a mix design that has too much manufactured sand, it's going to change the bleed rates of the concrete. And when that happens, you get excessive bleed water, and that ultimately really affects how that, that concrete is finished and, uh, and the hardness of the concrete. So mix design is really, really critical with regard to polishing that surface. Bob, how does the contractor control this? Because I've known a ready mix company or two that swaps things out on their own without even talking to people uh, call, and calling things an equivalent. And then also the, the foreign place contractor is not the polishing contractor. So the polisher is actually three, three orders removed. And then yet they're responsible. Yeah. So unfortunately, to answer your question, you, you can't control it in many scenarios. Uh, in our case, we kind of control the specification uh, with regard to the mix design, how that concrete is placed and finished, and ultimately how that concrete is is polished when we have national accounts. So everybody's on the same playing field, and we have what's referred to as a pre-slab meeting. And so all parties involved are engaged in the pre-slab meeting, from the ready mix producer to the owner's agent, to the architect, the engineer, the GC, um, the place and finish crew. So everybody knows what has been specified. But to your point, Jim, if it's not a national account and you have, you know, a smaller size polishing company, it's out of their control. And that's why I can't stress the importance of becoming educated in terms of uh, evaluating the substrate you're about to polish before you even turn the machine on and identifying any potential red flags and, uh, you know, get with the owner and say, look, these are some issues I want to bring to your attention before we even start polishing. 
and you're unfortunately sitting there at the time with a contract in hand that you you based it on what you expected, that seems like a, a easy place to go awry. Yeah, so that's a whole nother uh, uh, episode potentially is uh, a proper contract <laughs> because that contract is there to protect you also. What about here, Bob? Yeah, so um, the next, we talked about the mix designs and what's oftentimes overlooked is um, establishing in a benchmark and then setting all of your you know, your drains or um, penetrations like electrical stub outs um, to the proper elevation. And in a scenario like this, um, this is a very costly mistake because this is going to have to be demoed out. This is not acceptable. It's literally, it appears that it's one inch below finished floor elevation. So oftentimes as consultants, what we'll do is we'll go out and, you know, we'll have guys that are part of the place and finish crew. And the first thing that we'll ask is, did you guys uh, shoot all the elevations to make sure this unfortunate circumstance doesn't, doesn't happen again? And when it does, you know, I've even seen where they've missed installing sink drains, which you, means you're removing, you know, large panels of concrete. And what that does is it affects the overall project in terms of scheduling in the retail environment. Schedule is everything, and that's the number one consideration. But from our perspective, you know, if you're removing and replacing concrete, now you're waiting a minimum of three weeks to polish that surface. And then, of course, you're going to have a different color. So checking everything in terms of elevations is paramount, uh, you know, before before polishing a slab. Do you mean, Bob, that pouring two slabs side by side, you're not guaranteed to have the same color? I, I That's exactly <laughs> what I mean. <laughs> okay. You know, even just out of smaller, you know, area, Jim, maybe we have um, out of joint cracking and, and the clients suggesting or implying that that's not acceptable. And maybe they're removing one or two small panels and then they come back in and they, um, you know, use walk behind machines and where every everything else on the slab has been right on power trials, it's going to have a dramatic difference in color, which ultimately doesn't go away uh, when polishing. And that's, we'll get into it in, in future episodes, but that's why uh, from the polisher's perspective, it really is important to become a good color matcher. And you can work miracles uh, sometimes with color match dyes, you know, diluting blacks and grays to try to get um, problematic areas to blend better. We need to write that down as a topic, okay? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so we talked mixed design, we talked uh, elevations, and one of the most important consideration is the place and finish through and how those workers finish the concrete. For example, just the pitch of your blades could dramatically influence the final appearance. Uh, like if the blades are run too flat, it typically smears during the, the final phases. And that smearing is very similar to what the first picture looked like with an over sanded mix. And you can't get rid of that in some cases. Uh, probably four or five years ago, we started uh, uh, proposing that the place and finish guys do the last pass with these Teflon or these plastic blades. And that's really helped the polishing program because it doesn't burnish or darken it or, you know, like a warehouse slab, they want it burned in. And that, that term that we use is uh, burnished, you're burning it in where you get variation in color and you don't get that variation uh, with the plastic blades. So finishing is paramount to produce a good canvas for, for the polishing process. And again, Bob, you know, you're a national account, you have uh, companies that are used to polishing and then used to placing and finishing a, a floor for a Sprouts or, or a Cabela's that's going to polish. But what about, you know, the 5,000, 7,000 foot commercial project that they want to polish it? And they could have any number of different finishing companies in there that, that have been in front of a polishing job or not. What do you, what's the polishing contractor to do? Yeah, and oftentimes it's out of their control, and that's why I can't stress the importance of, you know, putting some stipulations in your contract that protects you and, and walking the floor. You know, I, I don't understand how some polishing contractors, I've heard horror stories where they're actually bidding a project in a different state, not even seeing the job, and then they show up and find all of these hidden secrets. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, I'll tell you, I give the place and finish crew so much credit because there's so many working and moving parts to properly installing, um, you know, a floor. Uh, and it's a challenge. I mean, some of our national accounts are the most challenging pours. You know, it might only be 25 or 26,000 square feet, but within that given area, 
you know, you're making sometimes two or three pours and there's, um, you know, all these penetrations between cleanouts and sink drains and all these different things that the place and finish guys have to go around. Not to mention, uh, as an industry, we are dramatically changing to reduce the carbon footprint. And so they're putting additives in the concrete, uh, byproducts basically. And that's changing the dynamic of how the, the, the finishers are finishing the concrete as well. Definitely a moving target sometimes. Oh yeah. So, you know, we've talked about, um, creating the canvas and the importance of, you know, what some of the challenges are, uh, from the polisher's perspective. And oftentimes they'll come into something like this. And by the way, that's already been polished, if you can believe it. And this was an improperly applied curing compound. So they used um, like a little machine that walks backwards with a, uh, a microfiber pad, basically. And it's applying the curing compound. And if when they're applying curing compound, you see streaks in the material um, while it's wet before it's drying, you can, you can bet on that material is going to differentially cure the concrete like you see right here. And uh, it's a permanent, unfortunate um, occurrence when that happens because you have cure compound, curing compound or curing membrane that's heavier and lighter in areas. And so where it's heavier, you've got a thicker build that's going to um, you know, uh, generally apply or, or cure out much darker than the, than the lighter areas. And so the only remedy in this case is to cut the floor deep. You really can't make that go away because it's permanently differentially cured that slab. And then of course we get back into, could we cut it all out? Possibly, but now we're, you know, cutting into the exposed aggregate. And what if the client doesn't want to see an exposed aggregate floor? Plus the added expense, you know, the added expense to, to cut a lot of the imperfections out. Bob, a small owner, uh, you know, not a, a large uh, chain, how many of them are informed on any of these items that we talked about today? Um, I, I think from the polishing perspective, the 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 smaller sized companies that are just getting into the industry, um, I would say, Jim, that unfortunately they're not informed um, oftentimes. And that's what I'm, you know, suggesting or implying is that that could really bite them in the long run. So I would encourage them to truly educate themselves, ask questions, and really become a good evaluator um, of, of the floor before you start. Like this picture, for example. I mean, that the owner needs to be aware that, look, you know, this, this is not going to go away mysteriously when we, when we run five steps of, you know, a polishing tooling over that. So it is important. Um, you know, some other consideration with, with, evaluating or walking the floor, oftentimes we'll have delamination and um, polishers don't even realize it until they run a, an aggressive metal bond diamond and the floor starts flaking off. So yeah, this it's just so important that, that the polishing contractor evaluates the floor because there's so many moving parts that happens before they even show up onto the job site. Great points, Bob. Uh, I understand that you and Leanne just went to Hawaii for a little trip. Yeah, yeah, we did. Actually, it was uh, business related. Uh, we had a, a floor that we had to, or I had to go look at over there. So we uh, took an extended weekend and uh, enjoyed ourselves. But what about you guys uh, on the ocean or in the pool uh, on a raft with a cocktail? Was that work too? Yeah, it was. <laughs> I know where you're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bob, thanks so much. And we'll see you next time, okay? Yeah, thank you, Jim.